डी डी जी आई सी सी आर एंड सिंह एंड श्री जयंत देव पुजारी टू काइंडली टेक द प्लेस ऑन द स्टेज द टॉपिक ऑफ दिस सेशन इज करियर ऑपरचुनिटीज इन द फील्ड ऑफ हिंदी संस्कृत और अदर इंडियन लैंग्वेजेस इंडोलॉजी बुद्धिस्ट स्टडीज योग एंड आयुर्वेद इन दिस सेशन रिप्रेजेंटेटिव ऑफ वेरियस ऑर्गेनाइजेशन वुड बी मेकिंग देयर प्रेजेंटेशन एंड टॉकिंग अबाउट career opportunities in their respective fields to begin with i request shri kumar tohin director general of iccr to kindly make the opening remarks uh, good afternoon uh, friends so welcome to the post lunch session on uh, the second day of our knowledge india uh, meeting and i mentioned post lunch session uh, because now we come really to the bread and butter issue of uh, of our conference uh, which is to deal with uh, career opportunities uh, of the students and the scholars who are working in these fields abroad uh this matter has been uh, flagged to us in iccr and also has been irritating the minds of uh, of people who are dealing with this area uh for many years now uh as to how do we sustain the interest of uh, students abroad how do we sustain the interest of scholars abroad and uh, the fact that there may be a a a decline which is not only not only occasional but actually appears to be a consistent decline in the numbers of students at least in some main areas uh, abroad has been has been pointed out and is very very obvious so what do we do with this uh now it is not that this uh, matter would have a very quick solution also it is not that this uh, is only typical to india study this may also be true with many other subjects also uh, but still this is still a fact which i think uh, warrants our very very serious attention and therefore what we have tried is that in this session we have brought uh the the people who who are real experts who are domain experts in this area who are dealing with this topic in day in and day out uh so that they can provide a perspective from the industry they also provide a perspective from some of those specific domains in which there may be a potential for for engaging with uh, students engaging with the scholars and also create some sort of uh, incentive mechanism or some sort of uh, an, an outlook in which people can look up to the day when they can pass out they can they can uh, study these subjects and hope to have a decent career so therefore we have today uh, both our apex uh, chambers here cii and fiki and also with them we have also some of those uh, uh, associations some of those experts and institutions uh, who can provide a uh, light to us who can again touch different aspects of it and again i'm not expecting that we will clearly have a solution at the end of this but at least we will begin to explore the contours of those solutions so we have uh, apart from ci and fiki we have publishers association of india we have ayurved drug manufacturer association we have uh, professor punya from iit roorkee uh, have i missed anyone probably any i have covered so what my request then will be that in this backdrop if uh, if uh, they can maybe initially they can speak for about 7 8 minutes 9 minutes because we have about 2 hours time for us and uh, then thereafter we can again as we have been doing in the past also we can open up the floor and we can take your inputs your suggestions and also we can have some interaction so that by the end of it we can uh, we can get some better sense of where we are standing in terms of career opportunities uh, thank you very much and let me uh invite uh, okay so let me again uh, hand the floor back to uh, uh sadhna ji so that she can take it forward thank you i first invite dr shweta sinha deshpande director and associate professor simbiosis school for liberal arts and fiki thank you sadhna ji 
Uh, good evening, uh, sorry, good afternoon, and welcome to this post lunch session. Uh, I have to first and foremost express my gratitude towards uh, ICCR and MEA uh, for inviting me here. Uh, amongst such stalwarts on Indian knowledge systems that I really feel be little actually in that sense because your experiences are way uh, about the Indian culture is far more enriching than my own. And uh, the last two days have been extremely intriguing and enriching for me as, as an academic. Uh, so I'm, a, I'm an archaeologist and an anthropologist by training. I also uh, lead an uh, academic institution, an undergrad, undergrad uh, program. And I think uh, that kind of gives me a certain perspective into the bread and butter issue Ambassador Tuhin talked about. While Indian knowledge systems, or for that matter, any uh, traditional knowledge system is under uh, the radar right now. We are struggling uh, under the wake of Western knowledge systems or Western ideologies and philosophies. Uh, it has its own uh, positives. The technology, the way we've evolved, has been something integral to the reason why we are all here. But I think in the post-COVID era, what has happened is uh, the life that individuals led and the struggles that they felt uh, led them to focus a little more towards uh, what do I have for me in this for the future. I think what do I have for me in this for the future has become the source of the bread and butter issue, uh, leading to a decline of, if for programs which are not employability centered. So humanities and social sciences are suffering, language studies are suffering across the world, uh, not just in India. And therefore, uh, Indian knowledge systems, I would say, is not something that is very different. It brings together uh, not direct employable skills, uh, to begin with for a young student. But at, uh, at an educational level, I think what we need to engage with is uh, understanding of the kind of skills that the knowledge systems, whether indigenous Indian or otherwise, provide a young individual and how that young individual then needs to take it forward. Uh, the term 21st century skills is something that has been propagated by the World Economic Forum. And it talks about critical thinking, it talks about uh, experiential learning, it talks about being able to work with a diverse population, uh, research and writing. And uh, frankly speaking, uh, ha after having all the conversations that have, we've heard since yesterday, uh, these are some skills that are definitely available within the Indian knowledge system. And what needs to be done is that it needs to be integrated within uh, the knowledge base that we are using at the school level or at the college level. Uh, Having said that, I think um, I also want to uh, share the fact that in my conversations with uh, all of you dignitaries uh, and scholars in different areas of Buddhist studies, Indology, uh, Hindi, Sanskrit, uh, as, well as, Ayushan, uh, as well as Ayurveda and yoga, I've realized that it, I can't have, we can't have a solution. One size does not fit all. Uh, and as an academic and who deals with someone, uh, students who are also individuals, and we've been talking about India and Indian knowledge talking about individualism in many, many ways, right? We have to think about every individual finding a solution for themselves. But what we need to be able to do is help these individuals to find those skills amongst the various uh, modes of education and the various systems of education that we offer. Uh, we are looking at building a certain awareness because it is this awareness uh, of Indian knowledge system across the world as well as internally within the country is going to help our students, as well as the industry. If the industry and the student need to work hand in hand, then there has to be something that, uh, some information that ties them together. And I think that is where um, your leadership is extremely important. We are looking at building that awareness through possibly uh, you know, faculty development programs, we need to talk about management development programs, where short programs can bring in skills from our knowledge systems into the industry and into our curriculum. Uh, trying to portray this as something out and beyond, I don't think is going to work. Uh, and I think uh, uh, the earlier session kind of indicated towards this that what is required is a slow baby step uh, uh, a process, a systemic process which tries to tie the loop. The loop where we are bringing in language, so you have Sanskrit and Hindi, as well as other traditional languages, because the knowledge is embedded in these languages. So we need scholars who will be able to study uh, these manuscripts and give, give us those nuggets of information, which then, uh, as, as institution builders, as uh, industry 
uh, members, we integrate within our systems because it is only through a very logical, uh, systemic pathway can we bring all of this into the mainstream curriculum. It cannot be imposed upon. It has to be done slowly. So in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the leadership that you bring in in your own uh, nations, in your own communities, what we are looking at is having you participate and help us bring that knowledge to the forefront, which we can take forward. Uh, I think the conversations around the change that the world is going through as a, so my under, undergrad degree was in uh, history and history talks about something called the axial age. Uh, an axial age is a time uh, in the world history where there is a huge change that comes through. And uh, I think in terms of India and its position in the world, that we, we, we're inching towards that, right? And to be able to represent that, we need to uh, showcase a much more structured, articulated uh, program in terms of uh, the Indian knowledge systems to the world. And therefore, uh, through the conversations across the breakup sessions yesterday, we heard about you know, regulatory bodies, uh, regularized curriculum, uh, maybe a standardized exam, uh, all of that. And I think a lot of it was also set towards government support. And uh, the government support definitely, like ICCR is taking forward, we are looking at uh, supporting uh, all of you because it is through support with you and the students that you will engage with, we can build exchange programs. Uh, I come from Symbiosis and Symbiosis has worked uh, with this idea of exchange programs where students from India and abroad uh, travel to each other's universities. And when international students come to our country and to our college, uh, we do offer a very uh, integrative program on India. Uh, this program is not just about the traditional Indian society, but it also talks about India today. When you talk about India today and connect it to India of the past, that is when that aha moment for a young student happens as to, okay, you can't look at the contemporary world in the absence of the past. So we, are, we do something such as that. We have also, in Symbiosis, introduced some courses uh, such as Vasudev Kutumbakam, which is a non-credit course, but every student is expected to participate in this course. Uh, it is offered in a hybrid model. Uh, students engage with faculty, they work uh, on posters, they read uh, literature, and they try and understand their own country, their own uh, cultural space that they belong to, which in the past or maybe through the school curriculum, they've not been able to engage with. Uh, the other aspect that we work with is um, trying to engage with students on Indian traditions in an academic framework. And uh, um, Ambassador, um, uh, sorry, uh, the minister was talking yesterday uh, about a, a, a conference where we were trying to talk and understand about strategic Indian culture. And this was a conference that was held in Symbiosis where the conversations was amongst academics, teachers, students, and industry personnel. So again, an environment which is created of conducive conversation, which is integrative uh, and does not try to um, sideline one or the other. Uh, we, I feel, also need to work with the idea of more literature, uh, which is accessible uh, for young individuals as well as adults. Uh, and I think I have someone from a uh, publication house here, and uh, I'm sure they'll be touching upon. But we felt, uh, and I've, I've had this conversation at uh, my own institution, we felt that when I or when we were growing up, uh, novels or comic books, Amar Chitra Katha was the way we understood our own culture. Uh, today, there is a culture of graphic novels. Uh, graphic novels today are not just giving you a certain traditional story. They also talk about the kind of skills, the kind of nuggets of information that you can draw from. And again, that is where we need Indologists, we need scholars from Buddhist studies, we need uh, scholars in Sanskrit and Hindi who can help us build this narrative uh, graphically, either in print media or in an online media. It is through this information that you, we will be able to create generations of young individuals who will then contribute and understand their own culture and take it forward whether it is in industry, whether it is in the diplomacy, whether it is in academia. But in the absence of these, uh, you know, um, uh, inclusive approaches, it will become extremely difficult uh, for any knowledge system uh, to find a foot in the door that is already closed for us. 
uh, and finding a foot in the door, I think, is to is is the beginning and not the end. Uh, activism might not work, but advocacy will. So I think uh, with that, I feel I would like to uh, uh, take any questions that come along that line. But thank you so much. I hope I have not overshot the time. Thank you. We'll do question answers after every two, three speakers. I now invite Sri Rajiv Vasudevan, co-chair, CII and Ayush, and CEO of Apollo Ayurved Hospital. Thank you, Dr. Shweta, for uh, making a fantastic opening speech. Uh, Ambassador Tuhin, Ambassador uh, Abhay, distinguished co-panelists, and uh, all the eminent uh, guests from overseas who have come to, who are lovers of India and Indian systems of thinking. So in the next eight to 10 minutes, I would quickly want to rush through a set of data which will outline the opportunities and then maybe invite questions at the end. So I'm not going to be explaining any of the points too much in detail. So with that, uh, so uh, the idea would be to reach career opportunities in going through a sequence of points which will allow us to grasp it better. So if you look at the fact that today, this is a very, very seminal study covering 204 countries over a close to 30 year period. And it shows that, first of all, people are living longer, but people are living with greater amount of disabilities across the globe. And the developing countries are affected even more. But the other thing to remember that even in countries where the longevity is high, the quality of life is suffering, whether you take Japan or you take uh, the US or Europe. Right? This is the trend which is available. So this slide is very important. When we look at opportunities in an ancient medical healthcare system, which is also a knowledge system, let us not forget that. So when you look at the, the uh, I don't think you can see this, there is a continuum of healthcare. We often tend to think of these traditional systems only in the form of medicines, right? Herbal products or you know, herbal mineral products. We forget that it is a complete system of health. In those uh, you know, couple of millennia back, there was no competition. There's no need to compete with modern medicine or any other pathi. So at that time, the, the wise people of this part of, the, the, of our earth conceived of an approach which would look at healthcare through the life cycle. So whether you begin with the primal prevention, which is the health of an expectant mother, so that the feet is yet to be born, has maximum life potential, or you take primary prevention. So when you talk of primary, when you talk of preventive healthcare, we forget it's a complete spectrum. But the important thing I want to tell, mostly across the world, today the emphasis is on this acute and emergency care. If you look at most countries' focus here. So if you look at it before and after, and that's where Ayurveda has got a unique application. Right? So I'll come to this. The secondary prevention and tertiary prevention in particular and promotive health is going to be a very important uh, opportunity. Suffice it to say, Ayurveda has got mainstream relevance. It complements what modern medicine can do, right? 
So whether it is a pre-acute, acute, emergency, post-acute, Ayurveda can be the treatment of choice for non-emergency medical care. Very different from the purely resort type of pictures that some of your countries or some of you might be familiar with. Right? So these are things which we currently do in India, which is approved by insurance, which is approved by health insurance companies, by the central government, and so on. So across mainstream medical specialities, mainstream chronic diseases, rehabilitation, all of this is being done today as we speak in India. So the other very interesting thing is that in this complete symptom-oriented healthcare system that we have, we forget that it is the patient who carries multiple diseases. Ayurveda's paradigm gives you a whole person approach, which not only takes in more than one condition at one time, right? And this is the largest healthcare share of healthcare spend globally. In the US, 76% of healthcare spend goes on people with five or more chronic diseases, right? In India, it's not very different. Of course, insurance typically is paying for single disease treatments. So I would say that in addition to disease, we are talking about compromised quality of life. So this is a huge area of opportunity uniquely before Ayurveda and yoga. So the other part to remember is that Ayurveda restores a virtuous cycle of good health. Why do we bring this? Because you're talking about career opportunities. What would people in your countries, what by learning, where do they apply it is the point you're coming to. This definition of good health that was uh, enunciated by Sage Acharya Shushruta some 2,600 years back, 700 years back, right? That still is far more encompassing than the WHO definition which dates back to 1976, right? In one go, it posits a framework for positive health, right? And Ayurveda restores this entire thing. This is what immunity means. Immunity is not the presence of vitamins or taking some tablets or supplements. It is the presence of all of this. So positive health. So Ayurveda enables that. So the thing about complex systems thinking, those of you who are academicians, Ayurveda is a perfect example of complex systems thinking applied to the health of any system. In fact, those in anthropology can even look at the interaction between man and his habitation, the local community society. It is so comprehensive in its approach as you can see here, environmental factors, the diet lifestyle, the genetic profile, all of this in a many causes, many effect paradigm. We are so used to a single cause, single effect paradigm, so going from that. So when we look at the fact that a concept called homeostasis, which is very current in modern medicine, which goes back to ancient Ayurveda, we all face stressors which are physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. There are spiritual, as you say, the dark night of the soul. All of these in Ayurveda gives a way to developing disease. So Ayurveda restores homeostasis. So good health in Ayurveda is the ability to restore homeostasis. So this thing going from physical stressors, mental to spiritual health is what we see. And this is attained through a multi-pronged approach. It is never a singular one size approach. It is personalized diet, personalized lifestyle, counseling or mental uh, factors, medicine, therapy, one or more depending on the stage of the disease and the patient. So it's not a one size fits all and it is locally, regionally, culturally sensitive. So what we prescribe in Australia may not be what we will do in India. What we do in one part of India, in south of India, in the coast, will not be what we'll do in Delhi because the same person at a different place at, at the same different time is a totally different person. So Ayurveda brings that immense potential of personalization. And this is done through a disease management approach. I just want to tell that appropriate diet and lifestyle, right? So as we told here that we take this entire thing, this affords tremendous career opportunities for people as we'll come into it. So the, the approach to all of this, we won't have time to go into it, but the fact that Ayurveda is a type of system of medicine which does not create a side effect, does not create a new disease, when it is practiced as a systematic science, as a knowledge system. So this is all nothing new. It is what was enunciated in Ayurveda in ancient times. I just want you to look at something very importantly. When you look at Ayurveda, we often think it is just some faith or folk healer sitting and doing something. This is what we would call the etiopathogenesis tree, 
for a serious diabetic patient with multiple symptoms, this is for somebody with an anterior horn cell disease, a neurodegenerative condition, right? But what I want to show you, these are the things on top, what you see here and the earlier one are the etiologies, the root causes, which lead to this disease, okay? So if you don't correct as the famous uh, American, I think uh, Dr. Osler or somebody said, you know, without the, with the right diet, there will be no disease and without the right diet, you know, not, no medicine can cure it. But this exactly is established here. But what I wanted to show you is the personalization and the sheer efficacy that happens when Ayurveda is approached as a mature knowledge system. I'll conclude in two minutes. So if you see this, three patients, all with distinct pathogenic histories, as opposed to what modern medicine in, in the 21st century posits. So this is the maturity of a system of medicine. And I want to tell that this is another tremendous opportunity, which is integrative medical care, which the government of India is proposing in a very big way. But look at the four areas, right? As adjuvant, which is supportive care, as a rehabilitation tool, post-emergency care, therapeutic wellness and promotive health. And initial focus areas are things like cancer care, road traffic accident rehabilitation, polytrauma, neurodegenerative disorders. So these areas, when you look at it, this is an example of where Ayurveda and modern medicine work together today in India. So if somebody is trained in these type of practices, can go back and start what is happening in the US and many other enlightened universities in the world to offer in medicine. Two slides on how medical value travel is happening. Today, you can see that a lot of people are traveling to Asia but most of them who travel to Asia from developed countries come for Ayurveda and yoga, right? So the developed countries are looking at Ayurveda and yoga as something which is a value addition vis-a-vis -vis what else is there. Other thing, if you look at Indians coming to India, Ayurveda is the number fifth cause for coming to India, non-resident Indians. Yoga and homeopathy is also there in the list. So the important thing, it is a highly valuable tradition which is adding value to people. And of course, in Kerala, if you see it, 1.2 million people visit every year. This is a few years back before COVID. Over 30% come for Ayurveda, right? So huge numbers in favor of Ayurveda. So today, the uh, market environment in India, and I would presume that progressively across the world, step by step, it would happen. So in India, we have a large talent pool, very supportive government regulation, it's important for me to tell you that quality standards for products and services are established. These standards from NABH are internationally recognized. So if a hospital in your country would like to follow the same standard, it is possible to follow that. Uh, appropriate integration with modern medicine straddles disease management and wellness with health insurance coverage. So this is what is happening in India. So this offers an opportunity coming to the, the career opportunities in products and services across a variety of um, types of services, curative, rehabilitation, therapeutic wellness, uh, the preventive health, which is detox, which is very popular internationally, leisure wellness, yoga, meditation, chanting therapy, and medical care. So I'm just giving an example of products across these categories, nutraceuticals, functional foods, cosmetics, lifestyle products. What could somebody who learns this in your country actually do, I will tell you, right? So they could manufacture or market some of these products. I've just put some examples here. Similarly in health services, this is the spectrum of opportunities. There are programs from the government of India today where somebody can enroll for a five and a half year undergraduate program and qualify as an Ayurveda physician, followed by three years of a postgraduate program. So all of that is done. There are similarly programs for each one of these. Why do I highlight some of these roles? Whether it is a geriatric care nurse, Japan requires currently about 300,000 geriatric care nurses. If you look at cancer care nurses across the world, there's nobody to look at palliative care and, re and survivorship care and end of life care. Po pediatric development disorders, autism, ADHD, muscular dystrophy, cerebral palsy, all these areas are very distinct things, but I also want to throw light on diet and lifestyle counselor, hair and skin therapist, beautician. One of the most well-known Indians is Shehnaz, uh, Shehnaz Mahmood, Shehnaz Ali, Hussain, Shehnaz Hussain, 
who set up an international empire just through this hair and skin therapy and products, right? Similarly, look at management. Anybody who comes and learns this can go back to their parent country and become a manager of a therapeutic wellness center or a yoga naturopathy center, also train in quality standards. And as an entrepreneur, they could look at being running a health resort, setting up a resort, or a shop in shop, setting up Ayurveda departments within resorts in your country, right? It's a tremendous entrepreneurship opportunity. A lot of people do it today. The big, big chains do it. Your graduates can do, look at doing that. Outpatient therapy center. This would be pretty easy to do. Investments are low and the, it, you don't have to get into serious medical care. So good opportunities. Inpatient hospitals with initial support from Indian partner. Medical value travel. I showed the slides on medical value travel because from all your countries, people would want to come to India for Ayurveda care. They can work here and work as a business development partner from here for Indian companies because somebody is familiar. Also a distributor for Ayurveda products. To sum up, NCDs, non-communicable diseases, chronic diseases, contribute a, the biggest chunk of healthcare needs, as well as rehabilitation. Preventive, curative, promotive healthcare. That's the spectrum of healthcare that is there. Huge demand for wellness, physical, mental, spiritual dimensions. And Ayurveda and yoga are well placed. So there are attractive opportunities. Thank you very much. I think I've taken five minutes more than my allotted time. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. I now invite Sri Pranav Gupta, General Secretary of the Federation of Indian Publishers, to make his presentation. Can I have the presentation up from the control desk? So, Namaskar and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pranav Gupta. I'm the General Secretary with the Federation of Indian Publishers and a Managing Director with a company called Prince Publication. Uh, a lot of people feel publishing is still a business of printing, whereas publishing is, you know, developing a thought, developing an idea, nurturing it. Yeah. So at the outset, I would like to thank ICCR and its leadership for inviting the Indian Publishers Association to speak on the Knowledge India program. And we'll be seeking the career opportunities what we have in the Indian publishing industry. But before that, I would also like to give you the overview and the market size, the growth potential what the Indian publishing industry possesses. So today's readers will be creators and innovators for tomorrow. Our civilization, the Indian civilization, if we talk about, goes back, root back through 5,000 years. And we have been knowing our civilization through the various writers they have been writing for us from the last five years. And at the end of the day, we'll be only be known in the future if the legacy continues and we have a robust publishing system. So importance of the publishing industry plays a pivotal role in the nation's development. Though we may not be a very, you know, our role in the nation development may not be look, looked at in a very tangible format. But yes, there's a greater thing as a qualitative change we bring in the society, the knowledge what we bring in everyone's life. Connects culture to local to global. So whether we talk about from the cuisines travel from one part of the world or the, you know, the designs or the textile designing from one area to the another area, all has been transformed and has been traveled from books. Publishing industry, I always say, is the lifeline of the education system. And we'll discuss more in detail in the next few slides. If I talk about the economic contribution, it drives both the domestic as well as the international economies. If, if you look at the domestic front, the Indian uh, publishing industry contributes 0.08% of the GDP. We are one of the largest publishing nations who export books from India to more than 160 countries across the globe. 
US, UK and Ghana are the top three importers from India in terms of importing print books. We are the engine of progress, encourages creativity and innovation in all aspects. A quick overview about the Indian publishing industry. We are the world's third largest print book market just after US and China. We are the second largest in terms of English language book publishing just after the US. 24,000 publishers operate in India and Indian print book market was at 722 billion in the financial year 2019-20 and it's almost growing at the close to 20% CAGR and we are expecting to cross 1,000 million by the March 2024. If we talk about the publishing industry, we can broadly divide into three main categories. School education, higher education and the trade book market. So 96% of, uh, of the publishing consists of the education and the 4% is the trade, which is the leisure reading, the adult fiction, non-fiction. So the publishing ecosystem in India, it's, it's mainly divided into three verticals. So school education. Largest in the world by the number of students. Majority of the school textbook publishing happens is the state sponsored by the NCRTs and the state boards. Sorry. Sorry, I just jumped on the slide. Yeah, so India has the demographic advantage I talk about. We are the world's largest populated country. We are the world's largest, youngest population we have. Largest population in terms of school education of more than 265 million. The number of internet subscribers, the 467 million plus social media US, uh, users we have. We have the largest Indian diaspora globally. The publishing ecosystem, if I talk about, as I said earlier, school education, higher education and trade books. 70% close to is school education, which is state-backed, state followed by the private players. Higher education, we have scientific, technology, medical, law, different areas, different verticals, predominantly dominated by the uh, private players. And if I took a talk about the trade book market, it's a growing market and we will deep dive where we see a lot of career opportunities in the trade book segment. So opportunities for the publishers at the moment, if we see. Lot of global publishing hubs at the moment outsource their work right from the pre-press to post-press to the Indian market because of the uh, economic, <coughs> the, uh, in terms of doing the production at a very competitive prices comparing it to the West in terms of pre-press, designing, marketing, transportation, everything. Education sector is growing. And Indian curriculum and the pedagogy is quite uh, capable and it goes well, especially with the SAR countries, few of the South Asian countries. And Indian educators have been able to design educational curriculums for a lot of African countries at South Africa, Ghana and everywhere. Another potential area for the Indian publishing industry at the moment we see is in the OTT areas. A lot of web series, a lot of movies are now being adapted through the books. And Another area, which is the growing area, which we will deep dive again in the next slide, is the language publishing. So number, as the schedule 8 of the Indian constitution, we have the 22 languages. And Hindi uh, is the predominantly one language where we have a large number of books and everything gets published. But there's a lot of translation which is happening in India and the other languages. So school infrastructure, if I talk about, in India we have more than 1.5 million schools. Higher education, if we talk about, we have number of uh, central universities, state universities, deemed universities, colleges, right from the high grade institutes like IITs, IIM, AIMS, IITs. And the new education policy and the recent government of India move has also given the opportunity for, to, for the foreign universities to enter India. So new education policy, which was rolled out under the leadership of the Prime Minister Modi, is a very vast and a robust exercise which India will go through a traditional Indian knowledge system in next 10 to 15 years. It is going to be rolled out in a phase-wise manner, it's going to be executed and a lot of things have already started taking place. So NEP talks on a variety of subjects but I have kept my slides related to what it talks about the promotion of Indian languages, arts and culture. So India's rich cultural heritage is a global treasure. 
our culture we talk about is almost a 5,000 years a rich uh, culture we have. We have more than 19,000 uh, dialects and number of languages we have uh, in the Indian publishing system. There has been very, uh, various challenges also we possess as an industry. Number of languages are also there, which are about to, you know, get a, <coughs> get a... If I talk about the technology and documentation part, web-based platform to document and preserve all Indian languages, these are certain initiatives which are being also done. Uh, scholarship and incentives, ICCR has been promoting a lot of scholarships for you know, promotion of Indian languages, but we need more institutes like ICCR to help in this regard. So new education policy from the school education perspective, it talks about one at the school level is to achieve a 100% gross enrollment ratio by 2030. Another key area for in this where the publisher comes in is the use of mother tongue, a local language or a regional language until grade five. More And this gives creates an opportunity for the Indian publishers to pr promote and publish a lot of new books. In the higher education also, the government recommends to have a lot of local language as the medium of instruction. And in recently, certain state universities and state boards have also already translated some of their uh, English language textbooks into the other Indian languages in the field of you know, sciences and medical as well. So if I talk about the market size of the print book publishing in India and the various, uh, you know, the categories if I bifurcate, you right from the pre-primary, we go to the total higher education segment. You will see the growth has always, always been in the double digits at the CAGR and by the uh, uh, financial year 24-25, will be almost 1,000 million plus. So trade book market, which is the leisure reading market, the adult fiction, the fiction, the children book, the graphic novels. The, if, if I talk about that, that constitutes almost 4% of the Indian publishing industry. If I compare it vis-a-vis -vis with US, UK, Australia, the trade book market for India is quite low still, if I talk globally. But uh, <coughs> if we see at 2014 and 15, our trade book market was close to 1900 billion rupees, which further grew up to 28 billion rupees in 1920. And if we see that trade book market in terms of language, it was almost 11 billion in uh, English in 2013, which would grow, grew up to 14. But you see a considerable increase from 2013, for, uh, for, from 14 to 20, from English to Indian languages, the number of books and the market size for Indian languages has been growing. So if we see, uh, we look at the chart, the pie chart at the si market size by the languages, th Hindi dominates the complete segment by 33%, followed by Marathi, Balyanam and Bengali. And then there are other languages uh, in which the books gets published. Number of books published in various Indian languages. So we took the chart of the year 2021 and almost 146,000 books were published in the year 2021. Uh, out of that, almost 45,000 books we had in English, followed by Hindi. Then we have a lot of publishing happening in Tim Tamil, Bengali, Odia, Marathi. And we even have a folk for literature, religious books, which gets published. So if we see the top most spoken languages in the world, out of that, you will see five to six Indian languages. They, f uh, they fall into the top spoken languages of the world right from Hindi, uh, Bengali, Urdu, you will see Marathi, Telugu, and Tamil. So here comes the career opportunity, the roles and opportunities what we have in the Indian publishing industry. First is the authorship. So any, any of the, uh, you know, students, scholars who are uh, studying abroad or uh, and uh, understanding the, and also, uh, you know, studying the Indian languages, they have a great potential in terms of, you know, writing books, research articles and everything. Especially if they uh, are doing some kind of research on subjects like, uh, you know, Buddhism, Ayurveda and so on. There's a lot of uh, potential for the scholars to enter as an authorship, as a profession. Then editors is one of the main, uh, you know, the backbone of, uh, you know, in terms of the literary sense. If you talk about, you know, editing is one skill set 
because majority of the publishing houses would prefer to have those set of editors who can do editing in more than one language. Translators play a very critical and a crucial role when we talk about, you know, international students studying Indian languages. Because translation is something, you know, a lot of people in today's time talk about that we have softwares, AI tools, which can easily translate. But it is the human who understands that emotion, that value, that meaning, you know, which, uh, where the translator plays a key role. I believe that DDG he himself here is a translator and poet and he has studied number of languages. I was looking at his profile. So the essence of the translation, I would say, is, is something pure, purely human that is required. Digital marketing is one another area which is growing in the publishing industry at large. So scholars, students, people who understand more than one language can make customized digital plans. You know, in today's digital marketing, where we have so much data, where we can have each specific campaigns, where we can have, you know, genre-based campaigns, where we have a region-specific campaigns. So any uh, for students who pursue their careers into this marketing segment and having knowledge about, you know, uh, more than one language makes a lot of sense. Content development is one another area where, you know, people at different area, they need customized content. Today, everything is, you know, need and specification required. Specific requirements are there by a different set of organizations. And, uh, you know, at times we get, even in the publishing industry, now we get sometimes insurance companies to write, you know, manual books uh, for their HR, you know, for their marketing toolkits. So a lot of content development opportunities are there within the publishing industry. Voice over artist, extremely flourishing industry at the moment, I would say. The rise in the audiobooks is growing at a very fast pace. It's a, a very, <coughs> uh, so not only in terms of audiobooks, even the, uh, the podcast, the kind of attraction it has gained in the youth is immense. So voice over artist, both in terms of, you know, for animation, for audiobooks, is a great potential for the students who can speak in more than one languages, who can read and write in more than one languages. Literary agent. A literary agent is something who technically negotiate rights between two set of publishing houses. So for an instance, if an ex-publisher in Delhi, they have published a book in English or a Hindi, and somebody in Spain or Germany wants to take rights. So literary agent is an established industry everywhere globally, and it is through them these uh, the, a matchmaking of these publishing houses happens. And uh, if a literary agent is a, another profession and a career, which uh, a scholar can always assume to, you know, uh, can create. And sales and marketing. A lot of US, UK and European publishing houses have their offices now in India. And similarly, now Indian publishers are also expanding their international reach. So it will be always good for the scholars in terms of the who understand different set of languages. For an instance, if I have to open an office in, let's say, Germany for the, my European Union business, and if I get a, a German student over there or a German employee who understands both German, Hindi, English, it makes my life easy. So there's a lot of opportunity in the management, in the sales marketing, and in the admin roles. So as I say, publishing is the lifeline of the education sector. I'll just quickly touch base that apart from publishing, the scholars, they can also, you know, try their luck in the <coughs> education se sector. And I will not deep dive. So these are the key three to six areas which will do. So teaching is one. So if you see, a lot of, uh, we have a large Indian diaspora in the Gulf region. And a lot of Indian schools and international schools teaching Hindi. We have a lot of CBSC schools, a lot of international schools which are into, uh, which teaches Hindi and other uh, Indian languages like Malayalam, Tamil, Telugu, Bengali. So a European teacher uh, applying a job in that Gulf area also understands Hindi and the other Indian languages will always have a better potential to get a job in these set of schools. Rest is research, policy, counselor, librarian, admin, and special educator. So through this, since ICCR invited us from the publishing industry, few key recommendations to grow the Indian publishing uh, on the global footprint would be the enhanced training opportunities for us. Under the guidance and the supervision of ICCR, we can also look at, you know, creating a Translators Guild of India, 
because that will be the bridge between you know for the scholars to understand and adapt more and pursue the careers in the publishing segment structure training programs training programs in terms of book publishing and uh, translation is need of the hour at the moment there are only 3 to 4 programs in india in terms of publishing and only two programs which are happening in their translation one at the ashoka university and one at the jadavpur university so some kind of financial support for the translators so that they pursue their career in the segment language centric institutional mechanisms where we can have the involvement of both center and state cultural diplomacy and international promotion that has to be the mandate for all our indian embassies and the uh, at the ministry of external affairs and all the 38 premium iccr institutes we have and at the end i always say india needs a strong book promotion policy the policy where we talk about creating from right from the mohalla libraries or having a book promotion officer at the district level or we talk about you know <coughs> uh, uh, having a project aid grants and uh, for the because we have credit lines with a lot of african and asian nations that could be one of the uh, things we need to have and more of the campaigns like har hath ek kitab or padhe india padhe india those kind of campaigns like the prime minister uh, created one of the campaigns instead of offering a bouquet offer a bunch of a book set so those campaigns needs to be done needs to be run so for in the interest of the publishing industry not only at india but at the global level and <coughs> when we talk about the knowledge based economy the federation of indian publisher received a message from the honorable prime minister and where he has acknowledged the role of the publishing industry so the amrit kal of next 20 year, 5 years is a period to give wings to our aspiration build a strong self reliant india knowledge has a central place and in this mission it goes without saying publishing industry will play an important role with these words i end my presentation thank you so much well uh, after three speakers we'll now have uh, about of some questions if you have questions public suggestions are there any questions so far any questions related to the three areas on which yeah mike this is one Hello, I'm Michael Zimmermann from Germany, University of Hamburg, and I have a question for Mrs. Depande. I think uh, when you when you uh, gave this speech, you entered into the topic of how to attract young people to the study of classical India. I think you touched on that topic. So my question to you is the following: Looking at my own institution in in Germany, uh, students who are interested in classical India are getting less and less and less. I think also in the introduction you are uh, to the left uh, he was he was touching on this issue various other departments like the department of japanese studies korean studies is booming especially korean studies the reason for that i guess is that korea has a lot to offer in terms of attracting young people to korea i think the same phenomena probably in india you have k pop you have k drama in japan you have a youth culture Uh, Akihabara, all these issues, which are very attractive for young people. Young people from the beginning are not so much interested in <coughs> classical cultures, but they need some something which draws them to the point. My question to you: Does India have something to offer in that respect? Or are you planning to come up with a topic which might be attractive for young people? Uh, yeah. So thank you for the question, uh, Dr. Zimmerman. Uh, I completely agree with you on the fact that. Uh, if we want students to be attracted to indian culture indian culture needs to reach out to them at their level so uh, while uh, talking about value systems and uh, philosophy is extremely important uh, like i said it can't be pushed on to them it has to be packaged if i may use the word 
uh, in a manner that will attract them. And I, I think the government is working towards, uh, you know, coming up with frameworks where they will be able to come up with uh, uh, media programs as well as uh, educational programs within the country, uh, which will invite uh, students from abroad in an academic framework. So, for example, I run a liberal arts program. A liberal arts program is a very different uh, it, from a conventional education program in the country, uh, which allows students to uh, engage with disciplines across uh, humanities, social sciences, sciences, business, and media. And what we do within the program, uh, and we do have a large number of exchange students who come to us, is while we are skilling them in all of these areas, we are also skilling them and helping them understand uh, the Indian knowledge system or the Indian philosophy, the Indian traditions. Uh, we are trying to understand, uh, for example, uh, if I may take, we offer a course on Mahabharat. Uh, and the course is not just about the philosophy of Mahabharat, but we look at it from different perspectives. We look at it from the perspective of archaeology, history, political science, sociology. And the output of that is not necessarily just imbibing those values, but seeing how the student can apply that in uh, the business sector, for example. You know, we're talking about business ethics. Uh, where Mahabharata is being used extensively. We are talking about Arthashastra, where we are talking about uh, its role in diplomacy and statecraft. So if I feel that what we need to do, and I'm sure the government is looking into it, and Fiki and uh, all other stakeholders will contribute towards this, is to make Indian knowledge systems uh, more accessible, right? And uh, the access will have to come in from the academic field, but as well as from areas where students are engaging with. So... Uh, e-space is extremely important, the cyberspace is important, the media space is important. Uh, so that is something that will have to be taken forward if we are really looking for the Indian narrative to go forward from where it is. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Could I add to that? Could I add to your answer? So, uh, Professor Zimmerman, just a quick point uh, to add. If you look at the fact that today the young in particular are looking at environmentally, they're environmentally conscious, they're looking at organic, they're looking at whole foods, they're looking at good for health, right? So these values resonate very well. And there's a huge market in Germany for Ayurveda and yoga. And uh, therefore, going away from the usual uh, careers, this affords a very good thing. So I think uh, more than Ayurveda, we didn't touch upon that part so much. But the fact that there is a tremendous environmentally conscious culture which is behind Ayurveda, which could resonate. Um, I think to add to that, you know, what we need to do is we need to look at the nuggets of information that exist in our systems of knowledge and then integrate it into different aspects, whether it's sustainability, whether it is health, whether it is mental health. You know, the world today is talking about mental health in a, such a big way where the Indian uh, psychology and the way you talk about the self and the larger globe uh, is extremely important. And if those are integrated in that fashion, I think uh, there's a lot more uh, accessibility of Indian knowledge systems in the world abroad. Yeah. Uh, thank you, John uh, Wardle from Australia, Southern Cross University. Um, I, I guess this was in some ways uh, presented to you, uh, uh, Dr. Vasudevan, but also more generally. Um, and I guess one of the things that we have in, in our centre, we teach AOSH, um, we have students going through that. Next year we're bringing uh, the first Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade funded traditional health knowledge tour of, of students through India uh, next year. There's a lot of interest from the students where the issue is, is they hit a brick wall uh, with employers and um, businesses afterwards. And what we found is there's a lot of facilitators of links in Australia, economic links, the Chambers of Commerce, the... Australia, India, uh, Chamber of Commerce, for example, is very interested in health, but focuses on vaccine manufacturing and, you know, all those sort of other things. Indian knowledge is seen as a cultural cost to get those bigger prizes rather than actually a prize itself. How do we, I guess, you know, flip that to get some of those decision makers which can serve as breaks towards collaboration and career opportunities um, to think about Indian knowledge as an economic growth engine, not just a cultural growth um, engine for collaboration? So, Dr. Waddle, I was just looking uh, to your brochure as during the you know, previous speaker's speech. And uh, what you're doing in your university, in your department, is laudable. And it's extremely solid work. I also see that you have former president of the 
Australian Medical Association associated with your department. What I would tell is that every society has got an underbelly of health problems which are not being addressed. So if you look at what you're doing in your department, by bringing in Ayurveda and yoga into that beyond naturopathy, I think that would probably bring tremendously valuable job <coughs> skills, which makes them employable in the market a lot more because we can extend the scope of the care that is being provided in your department. So I would just urge that both from an industry angle or from an association angle, you'd be happy to engage with uh, your university to see how we can add value to your students and make them more employed. I don't know if that answers the question you had. No. Something more. A little bit, but more about how we can stop the perception. More, more about how can we stop the perception of collaboration and Indigenous knowledge um, between countries like Australia and India. How can we actually change the dial at the political conversation in countries like Australia so it's not just about cultural connection but economic connection as well? Yeah. Right. Can I take a quick... Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Please. From the economic connection angle, there has to be a set of regulations which will permit this collaboration to happen. And I think today we have a very receptive government in India and I think a very friendly partnership with Australia. And I think this is something that we should explore seriously to see in the realm of naturopathy, how do we really bring forge business opportunity? I think it is possible to take it step by step. I think to add to uh, uh, what Sir was talking about, I would like to say that uh, traditional knowledge uh, across the world has always been perceived as something more cultural uh, rather than uh, an economic aspect. And I think we were discussing this yesterday as well that you know the if you're talking about health, if you're talking about yoga or Ayurveda, it needs to be recoined in the context of health rather than using it as uh, either a, a cultural aspect. So it's not a cultural uh, artifact. It is something, it is a science. It has something to do with your health. And if, if we want to take uh, traditional Indian knowledge as a system of, a scientific system of treatment or learning, then uh, both it, the conversation needs to change within the country and outside the country. And the government will definitely have to take a, a, a stronger role forward. But that is where I think uh, the roles of young individuals who are studying these languages and these cultures in your country uh, will play a huge role because they will be the one who will be ambassadors of this information which moves beyond a cultural narrative to an economic narrative or a health narrative or diplomacy narrative, whatever it may be that we want to explore. Thank you. One last question in this round, and then we'll proceed to the... I'm Edem Theodore from Israel, and I'd like to address my question to Mr. Pranav Gupta. Uh, <clears throat> you were talking about uh, job opportunities, and I realized that there's an opportunity for me, perhaps for all of us, to publish with Indian publishers. Personally, I published two books in English, Indian editions, and now working on a Hindi uh, edition. So my question is, can you please survey the opportunities as far as in the logical um, publications. You, you, you mentioned about 200 universities and thousands of colleges. What is the scope for, I guess for all of us, to publish Indian editions in English and vernacular languages? What's the market for the logical uh, literature? So almost if I talk about in terms of the uh education infrastructure, you know, so all central and state universities and the deemed universities, they have the specific departments for these subject areas. And I see there's a huge potential for, you know, in terms of uh, the books, uh, if they get published into the English and other Indian languages, the market is growing. As, and as you could see from my presentation, the number of students uh, is growing uh, with the increase in the number of institutions. And with the new education policy being rolled out, uh, there has been a lot of students who, who have been dropped out during the course of their uh, study structure, uh, which the new education policy also brings them back. So I feel there is a very strong, uh, you know, growth opportunity for, and the strong opportunity for the, you know, all the international scholars to get their books published, uh, you know, in the Indian market. And not only just the Indian edition, there are Indian publishers who are phenomenally doing very well 
and probably and a lot of uh, you know the southeast asian countries the a lot of african authors they are now getting their original editions now published in india and further they are being translated into international and other indian languages so india is eventually looking forward to become a publishing hub globally that is the way we are moving forward thank you we will now go on to our next speaker mr ranjit purani from the ayurved drug manufacturers association right uh, i represent the ayurvedic industry and i'll start by acknowledging uh, excellencies Dr. Shweta and a mentor of sorts to all of us in Ayurved, Dr. Jain Dev Pujari ji. Uh, I represent the Ayurved industry. I also represent a company that is uh, traditional in nature, has been in manufacturing Ayurvedic medicines for a better part of the last 151 years. I am the fifth uh, generation in my family to continue the business and seventh member of my family to take it forward. and we are finally focused on manufacturing uh, there was a great event last december in goa the western part of india where uh, uh, the uh, at behest of iccr we organized uh, uh, as part of a larger ayurved forum we organized the ninth world ayurved congress uh, we had around 5500 odd delegates Uh, we had around 200 countries uh, that had represented uh, their traditional medicines and their interest in ayurved there but most importantly uh, almost 235 uh, foreign students studying ayurved in india uh, were also present there uh, from almost 37 countries i'm sure most of these countries are represented here in this hall today and uh, the the moment was was uh, a great milestone for all of us because uh, even the prime minister when he came in for the valedictory session made it a point to take a photo with all of those students i wish i would have brought the present the, the photo right here and showed it off to you but i'll introduce uh, next i will how does one do next i don't have it next can you do next okay right i represent the ayurved industry i'll just give you a small uh, brief on this uh, yes we are traditional yes we are uh, maybe our, our science goes back 2500 to 3000 years but we are a robust uh, industry today in india it's estimated that our industry size is almost us dollar 23 billion in india there are more than 8800 licensed manufacturers as manufacturers we use over 1200 medicinal plants uh, minerals we use animal by products and also some marine origin materials in in the uh, uh, in the formulation of all our medicines uh, there is a complete regu- regulatory framework at par with pharmaceuticals present in india which which regulates us and uh, this is something uh, that i need to explain a little bit in detail because in 1970 uh, my my sector the traditional sector was made a part of the drugs and cosmetics act uh, which generally governs the pharmaceutical industry so we had an entire chapter inserted in the drugs and cosmetics act as uh, late as 1970 and the important part is that probably india is the only country that gave uh, an absolute absolute advantage an absolute approval okay an absolute approval to everything given in ancient treaties so uh, uh, the first schedule of the drugs and cosmetics act enlists around 54 ancient textbooks which are compendiums of ancient knowledge uh, as reposed in ayurveda siddha as well as yunani and these textbooks everything given in these textbooks as said 
2000, 2500 years ago, some of the textbooks were written even in the 10th century. tapped into repositories of traditional medicine as part of their entire drug discovery programs. But the important part is that they're continuing to look at molecules. They're continuing to look at something that they can synthesize and take forward. And it is said that almost 40% of, of modern medicine has its roots in, in traditional medicine. But that apart, the entire decoding of traditional medicine in the original syntax that it is intended has not yet been done. And this is the particular task. This is the whole vocation for scientists, for scientists, uh, practitioners, and research leaders to come about as part of, of traditional medicine. Uh, there is, of course, something that Rajiv talked about, which is the network clinics and, and hospitals. That, of course, is a vocation that's there. But the entire, we are seeing a maturing. We are seeing an absolute maturing of marketing management, the outreach from a traditional medicine sector beyond the 600,000 registered traditional practitioners in India and tapping into the 1.2 million uh, modern practitioners with uh, formulations and medicines who are having their original syntax intact from traditional medicine is something that's happening. So this challenge of communication and that's that's what I call as marketing management is very much uh, very much a, a vocational 
opportunity that's available in my entire industry. Today, media has taken great interest in, in traditional medicine in India, but uh, you don't really see a lot of, we see a lot of uh, writings about traditional medicine in the local languages, but you don't see it really come in in, in major uh, national dailies and supplements. So if, if there are students who are studying Ayurveda from your geographies and they can really write, then this is an opportunity that, that very much is there in my industry. I also see uh, some future opportunities that, that come about. And of course, it, it talks about content providers. And uh, I will explain content providers more from the, from the realm of a translation science approach. And this uh, would require each one of these graduates uh, from your geographies who are traditional studying Ayurveda or Ayush sciences within India to be uh, extremely informed with regards to the, the, the sciences or the allied sciences all around. Because this, this entire aspect of translational science to talk about the difference between a traditional approach uh, to metabolism versus it's something that a slide that Rajiv uh, had shown, uh, this translation science is going to be the cutting edge uh, vocation or career opportunity that I can, I can identify in the next 20 years. And, and not only in terms of research, but also being ability to communicate further. Of course, uh, a rote uh, language translation is something that's also required. But all of these $23 billion, the, the kind of galloping commerce that we see, uh, puts immense pressure on natural resources. So there is great amount of opportunity for even international sourcing of our raw materials, uh, whether you call it agroforestry or if you just call it just plain farming. Uh, you know, there's not a land, lot of land available in India. There's not a lot of agricultural uh, 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 activity sometimes happening in medicinal plants, but most of your geographies are well adept, the same kind of eco-climatic zones. If there are agro agro-inclined kind of uh, students and vocational careers that can be pursued. Uh, certainly my sector can offer that kind of uh, a, a economic activity in, in that regard. And the uh, gentleman from Australia should know that uh, there is an Australian company by the name of Quintus, which has uh, a captive cultivation of 25,000 hectares of sandalwood. Of course, they've done that for the perfumery industry. Uh, but the aspect is like the sandalwood is very much a rare and endangered and threatened species in India. And my industry also uses a lot of sandalwood. So these are the kind of collaborations that can also take place once we, once we talk in terms of traditional medicine and the emerging career opportunities that come there. And of course, uh, when you talk about, uh, right here is an example of Vaidya Jain Dev Pujari, an absolute eminent practitioner from a city called Nagpur. Uh, he's heading the National Council of Indian Systems of Medicine, the chief regulator of educational sciences in India. Similarly, we have Vaidya Rajesh Kotecha, another traditional practitioner who's, who's actually an administrator, a, the secretary of Ministry of Ayush. Now, there is this entire administrative cadre itself that can come about, and I am more than sure that the students from your geographies who are learning Ayurveda, one of the first things that they would probably they would probably take up is is the kind of the, the setting of the entire regulatory framework for acceptance of these traditional sciences even in your country. So this kind of regulatory dialogue between India and your countries uh, these are these are vocational opportunities whether as administrator or as regulators that I that I see coming in 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 times to come. And uh, I see. Uh, a lot of interest. I am also the vice chairman of a newly formed Export Promotion Council. And the kind of interest that we see uh, from uh, almost 176 countries that Ayurveda is exposed, e exporting its entire medicines. Uh, right now, we are exporting a whole deal of raw materials and raw medicinal plants, but this is fast changing to uh, products and medicines put up for retail sales. So this is the kind of profiling, this is the kind of economic activity, this are, there are great amount of vocational challenges 
there is a great arbitrage opportunity available for even your students who have to take up careers in IU sciences to also manufacture or better do value add in their own geographies and export back into India. So I believe uh, Ayush Sciences is going to very much be a, a uh, uh, is very much going to be part of uh, free trade agreements between geographies in times to come, and not just one sentence or a paragraph, but be very much as as a point of of discussion. And uh, you know, after 150 years, my industry, uh, my company realized we sat down. And we said, uh, what exactly do we really do? And what exactly have we really done? And that's when we realized that generations of doctors who have depended on us and generations of the family and generations of the entire team in, in my entire company, one of the things that came about is that, you know, all, all said and done, we're delivering health. And we're delivering holistic health. And all of this leads to happiness. So each one of your students that engages themselves with traditional sciences, which has survived all kinds of challenges for eons. It's not just 2023 and the world right now that's challenging traditional sciences. These challenges have been on in every era. The aspect is only the truth survived. And that's the entire point of, of really engaging with traditional sciences and traditional medicine, because ultimately it all leads to happiness. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have two more speakers in this session. I call Professor Vishwendra Singh Punya from IIT Roorkee. Uh, namaskar to everyone and so i'll be talking about uh, the upcoming iks ecosystem at iits iits has uh, i think most of us know the premier uh, technological institutes in india they are primarily focused on uh, engineering and uh, sciences a limited component of humanities but uh, after NEP 2020, there is a, a growing interest, as all of us know from Professor Murthy's presentation in IKS areas as well. And uh, uh, so I'll, I'll take the example of IIT Roorkee, but this applies to all IITs or most of the IITs. So there are uh, IKS centers coming up at most of the IITs. And let's say at IIT Roorkee, we have around 20 faculty members from across 11 departments. and the primary uh, mandate there is to teach, uh, uh, there are around 10,000 students. So to impart an integrated understanding of IKS fields to engineering students. And for that, we have designed a two credit IKS 101 course, which needs to be taught to all the uh, first year UG students of IIT Root, which, which is uh, around 1,400 uh, students. And so we essentially have few courses. The point is that even, uh, even though the, uh, the IK centers are coming up at IITs, but we do not have enough faculty members, we do not have enough trained people to uh, teach uh, these things. And uh, uh, in this sequence, uh, IIT Roorkee organized uh, a national youth conference on Indic knowledge systems, which saw a huge participation from various IITs. This was organized in collaboration with University of Patanjali, Central Sanskrit University. And uh, 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 so talking about career opportunities, uh, IIT Roorkee and all the IITs, uh, most of the IITs are looking for regular faculty members, honorary professors uh, in various domains of, let's say, Sanskrit studies and uh, Indology and uh, uh, the domains which overlap with engineering and sciences. Apart from the regular faculty cadre, we have the visiting adjunct faculty members, uh, the possibility of having adjunct faculty members, the professors of practice. So professors of practice, they do not need to have a PhD degree. They can be a practitioner of any field. And if they are distinguished in that field, they can be 
uh, they can uh, be there at IIT, uh, IIT Rudki, especially for let's say one or two years, and and contribute in teaching and uh, research. Then uh, we are uh, looking for graduate and post uh, postdoctoral candidates, and uh, uh, so these are the contact details. If uh, if somebody because this pool is going to be extremely uh, helpful in developing the IKS initiatives at technological and science-based uh, institutes. Uh, let me give a, an overview. Uh, so at the moment, around 12 IITs have programs, uh, have started programs in these uh, various disciplines, which pretty much overlap with the expertise of the people present here. And uh, there are a lot of opportunities in IITs, uh, in, uh, in these domains, anybody, any expert in various capacities. and. Uh, Apart from this, I'll, uh, I'll give you an example of an experiment that IIT Rudki did in collaboration with Sanskrit Bharati. So IIT Rudki developed an online course uh, called Subhashitam Sanskritam. So this was basically a spoken Sanskrit course, contained five modules. There, so there were around five modules. And uh, uh, it was floated in 2021. So it saw uh, registrations from around 14,000 people from across 20 countries, a lot of Indian diaspora as well. And even up to level five, 2,400 plus uh, uh, students were given certification. So uh, up to level five, 2,400 people completed the exams and the basic requirement of the course. The, uh, the point here is that, uh, uh, and later on, just to, uh, just to complete this, later on, this course was made online in collaboration with Newton School. Newton School is a is an edtech company, education technology company, founded uh, founded by IIT Roorkee alumni. And uh, so this course is not for profit, but this has a potential of commercialization as well. <clears throat> what I'm trying to convey is that uh, that uh, there is a lot of uh, potential of commercialization of basic courses on IKS related areas, Subhashitam Sanskritam, the idea was to impart the knowledge of Sanskrit along with uh, the dharmic uh, principles embedded in Subhashitams. But this uh, example gave us a confidence that uh, a lot of content generation can be done in these domains and that can create a lot of career opportunities as well. Uh, uh, so th these are some data about the course. I'll, I'll not uh, maybe go into the details of the data. Apart from this, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, the structure of our IKS 101 course, which is meant to be all the engineering students. And uh, at the moment, as you can see, that it contains a lot of topics, which means we cannot go into the details of each of these topics, but we would uh, like to develop courses on these different, uh, each of these uh, topics in more details, which can be floated as electives. And those can be done, uh, and this is happening at all the IITs, I would say. So those can be done by the experts in this domain, and they can be there for six months, and then teach the course, and then again go back. So this, uh, so there is a lot of such possibilities that are there. Finally, uh, I would say that uh, at uh, our institute, we have active research groups on these domains. Uh, for example, the study of uh, active compounds in medicinal plants, study of the process of making bhasma, and uh, computational linguistics, and the design principles based on vastu shastra. So uh, there is a lot of research going on, but uh, it has a potential of converting into products. And in order to facilitate that, IIT Roorkee has uh, a business incubator by the name Tides, and, uh, and which has uh, done quite well. Uh, and what uh, I'm trying to say is that if we have the expertise from the real practitioner of this field, then uh, possibly, uh, let's say, from the inputs uh, of the experts in Ayurveda, maybe some of these research can also be commercialized, which will further create career opportunities and employment opportunities for a lot of people. So, uh, so essentially, what I, uh, what I wanted to convey is that this upcoming ecosystem of IKS centers at various IITs is creating a lot of opportunities in teaching, research, and startup uh, ecosystem. And 
and for iit road ki you can always uh, get in touch with uh, head at iits thank you so much and thank you to i to icci Our last speaker for this session is Sri Jain Dev Pujari, Chairman of NCISM. So, namaste to everybody, and good afternoon. I understand that uh, always these post-lunch sessions are difficult, not only for the listeners but for the speakers also. so and still you are clapping i i congratulate you all that it shows that you are all uh, giving proper attention uh, to what speakers are uh, talking about and uh, here once again um, i am very much thankful for the organizers for two things one calling uh, a regulatory body here to discuss with you number one and that also on the uh, opportunities business opportunities career opportunities that is very important part just discussing academics just discussing the subject does just, just discussing the expertise is not only enough but we have to see how we can implement how we can generate the lakshmi out of that out of saraswati and when saraswati and lakshmi they go together you know how uh, a very well a country or a land or even a globe universe can grow like anything so uh, as i told you we have, we have been established ncism is established by the act of the parliament indian parliament in 2020 and uh, we started working in our office from uh, 11 june 2021 so uh, we are baby that way but we are a regulator and uh, you know in every country regulators they are very powerful and they hold the uh, many many powers with them uh, so we started creating the regulations of for, to implement our act because act is always a precise one and to implement uh, that act uh, we have to create the uh, regulations so uh, these are the new re- regulations based on the new act and uh, there are few opportunities for the people of uh, people like you experts like you uh, and we are making some provisions in our uh, regulation also the first one is uh, we are very much close to sanskrit because sanskrit is the basis of ayurveda all our texts are in mostly in sanskrit and uh, that's why those who are running sanskrit departments they are uh, very close to our heart and if they are studying ayurveda text then nothing like that so you are always welcome for that and uh, we came up with a new new system of education where uh, main course is there which is which has been taught uh, in the colleges in the hospitals etc and the other are electives those which are not in the main course they are all in the electives and uh, as per uh, national education policy 2020 uh, we have converted these electives uh, uh, into the credits and then this credit convert into marks and they are uh, they the, those we have attached to the uh, viva marks they those uh, credits uh, will be added in the viva marks of that student so for one and half year he has to complete the student has to complete uh minimum 3 electives and uh, uh, we have a five and a half years course so minimum 9 electives he has to complete excluding uh, this internship and uh, for this 9 we are open now we are we are with uh, around 30 electives but with your expertise you can write to us and uh, there there is a structure for these electives um uh, all these electives will be online courses uh, 45 hours and some distribution is there and there is a financial arrangement also so uh, if if your uh, elective is uh, accepted by our commission then there will be financial arrangement between your university with between your institute uh, to uh, with ncism that is national commission for indian system of medicine so that is one thing you can do this uh, 
we always prefer for an institute or a university because we can go with an individual also but um, it is always better for us to go with the institute and uh, because it is compulsory uh, you will have minimum uh, not less than 1 lakh students at a time at ug level and not less than 15000 student for at pg level so uh, these are the things even at the phd level we have we have decided to um, add some electives but that regulation has to uh, come this is the one part where the academicians like you can co- uh, contribute and there will be a uh, financial arrangement there is we are working on a regulation that uh, if your institute of if your university is interested in uh, starting because we are dealing uh, with uh, the education not less than graduation we our 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 power starts with the graduation level education so graduation post graduation phd super specialization like that we regulate if your institute or if your uh, uh, your university wants to start a ayurveda college at your place or in collab- in collaboration with the indian universities yes there is a provision for that and uh, looking at the demand all over the world uh, there will be a great scope and uh, there will uh, we are sure that we have worked over that that there will be a financial stability uh, for that course that will be a sure one and uh, as iccr is already providing uh, scholarship to nearly 120 uh, students every year who are coming uh, from abroad to study ayurveda here five and a half years course here and they are again going back so these people from your geographic lo- locations these students Uh, will be of uh, immense help to you to to conduct this type of activities because they are institutionally trained in india so these activities are also helpful for uh, you uh, another thing is those who are working on the manuscriptology particularly sanskrit manuscripts they are also uh, welcome by our commission because um, as uh, um, honorable ranjit puranik ji said that uh, our our whole um uh, the uh, regulatory structure for for manufacturing uh, ayurvedic medicine is based on uh, only 54 uh, important uh, granthas that is text uh, that is traditional granthas the importance he has already described but ayurveda is not limited to that according to the uh, estimation done by us and the other people there are nearly 1 lakh manuscripts even today available all over the world not only in india but all over the world particularly in european countries or uh, some south asian countries if uh, your institute or the person or a professor or a student from your institute they are working on that uh, we will find out the way to help for such type of activities so such type of proposals are also uh, we are working for for example just just example i will give you and uh, there is there is a uh, book called chatushtantram but it is uh, written it was written in basically tibetan language or it was translated i don't know and uh, uh, that we are we want to trans- get it translated in the, it in english and hindi because uh, the the medicinal plants used in himalaya range they are very very, very well described in the chatushtantram so such type of activities are also welcome from our uh, commission uh, the awareness regarding yoga is also increasing day by day but there is an independent arrangement for yoga in the ministry of ayush and uh, yoga council may be established by the act of the parliament soon that is what we are expecting Uh, the courses if you are learn, uh, running in ayurveda which are below the graduation then again there is a provision for uh, accreditation of such courses by government of india that is by rashtriya ayurved vidyapeeth r a v that is so if you search for this rashtriya ayurved vidyapeeth then uh, uh, you will get that portal for application of for accreditation of such courses which you are running at your places and uh, your course whatever you are running regarding ayurveda small course less than uh, graduation uh, 
uh, will be accredited that will that that will improve the uh, the status of your uh, ayurveda course that is what i uh, understand uh, now uh, this this is the era of uh, chain clinics our rajiv vasudevan ji is sitting over here and you can take guide guide guidance and guideline from him that how in what way he is working and uh, you can try at your place with the help of your institution and there is a huge demand for such type of activities all over the world uh, here in india uh, nearly uh, 6000 uh, registered medical practitioner of traditional medicine are there and out of that 13500 institutionally trained in in, uh, in india practitioners they are practicing abroad they have their association they are going for teaching they are going for uh, giving advice they are going for uh, giving advice regarding diet and treating the patients and uh, now 16 countries they had they have changed their regulation and which are which, uh, which is favoring to the practice of uh, traditional medicine so that rigidity in the world is uh, regarding traditional medicine and uh, considering it as unlawful activity is reducing day by day the best example is of switzerland switzerland has made correction in their act to uh, facilitate the practice of uh, this traditional medicine particularly ayurveda in that country so uh, the scenario of of traditional medicine in the world is changing now india has become a leader in uh, traditional medicine because Uh, of the activities and initiatives taken by government of india and uh, uh, the gctm global center for traditional medicine has been established by who in jamnagar india so the research type of uh, research activities uh, will also continue in that center and uh, this is the scenario and uh, you can find out the opportunities at your place you can find out the persons and uh, the initiatives which are taken at education level i have already told you and anybody uh, working with the sanskrit in at higher level higher than whatever is there because sanskrit is a this is the only professional course where uh, language is compulsory in in any other professional course language is not compulsory so in ncism we have made compulsory uh, for first year to all bms students and uh, in post graduate also if if he is going to do a uh, post graduation in samhita that is classical text then he has to complete few electives on uh, on the uh, sanskrit grammar and tantra yukti and anupta and leshokta that all so experts in the sanskrit they they can understand this very well so uh, um, being a regulator we are we are not uh, in a way uh we don't have any direct opportunity for uh employment or business but still these are the initiatives taken by us which can uh help you people to take up such type of activities on behalf of <coughs> uh, uh on on uh, behalf of uh, ncism once again i am thank you i am thankful to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to come over there and have two words with you thank you thank you very much ladies and gentlemen we've run out of time as we have a session with the honorable minister of education at 5 o'clock and we have to prepare the stage for that keeping that in mind we'll take just one question yes and and Yes, just one question, and then you can continue with your questions outside while having a cup of tea. I, my name is Dembrel. I am from Mongolia. I would like to ask the question from Vasudevan and uh, Ranjit Pranik. Uh, because in my uh, country, the Himalaya, the way the industry manufacturer. the exporting ayurvedic medicine do the ayurvedic uh, factories study certain geographical specific uh, people's lifestyle and dietary and culture and weather some of those things and because uh, the, my friend asked me 
bring some Ayurvedic medicine, Himalayan drug from uh, Delhi. Because uh, when the uh, drug selling in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, the color smells different from selling in uh, Delhi. That's why the, she asked me bring Asli Dawai bring from India. They do not, don't have the Ayurvedic center in physicians and therapists. Uh, your question is uh, either an Ayurvedic medicine from or a medicinal plant from the Himalayas or is about a medicinal plant manufactured by a large Indian company called Himalaya Drug Company. Yeah. Now, uh, why would the medicine, the different. same medicine be different uh, in aroma, texture, and, uh, yeah. uh, and feel as marketed in Mongolia versus yeah. marketed in India? Yeah. Uh, I am not the best person to answer that question. But yes, uh, I can tell you uh, there are times when in India uh, we have to uh, we are allowed to formulate the medicine in a particular manner. But uh, maybe your uh, regulatory paradigm uh, demands that the company had to reformulate uh, the formulation to comply with your regulatory standards. And that's one of the reasons why uh, maybe the aroma, the texture of the capsule, or maybe they're marketing it as a cellulose capsule versus in India, it's more of a tablet. So these could be uh, some small and large kind of differences. But if it's the same medicine, generally speaking, the active ingredients would be the same. So uh, the company is large. It's a standard company and would have certainly taken care to ensure that its del delivery of the promise would be the same in, in both the dosage forms. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have to? I will respond to your question offline. I'll come back to you later. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll now take a very short tea break. Please be seated much before 5 o'clock. Quickly have a cup of tea. You can ask your questions to the experts. And then kindly be seated at least five minutes before 5. Thank you. <laughs>